Okay, now we're going to talk about growth. 50% of the Fortune 500 companies from 1955, and that's when 19, the Fortune 500 companies started, uh, do not exist today. 50%. They're all gone. And you know, uh, so since 55, when the Fortune 500 was created, more than 1,800 companies have appeared on the list. Many of these companies have changed their names over the period, owing to mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcies. Other companies have gone private or simply changed their names. Um, one example is Chrysler. Chrysler's gone from the Fortune 500 company because it's a privatized company now. It went out of business. There's many, many others. Uh, so the world has changed. So even though I wasn't in business in 55, I was only 10, I, I, I know that there's names. Uh, I don't think there's Montgomery Ward anymore. Uh, there's a lot of things that aren't around anymore. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and not all of them left in a good way. Uh, you know, a lot of them left in a bad way. Um, Enron, uh, I think, was a Fortune 500 company. It's obviously gone as well. Uh, 6.5 billion people on Earth, less than 50% with phones. Growth. Well, I told you telecommunications. So we got half of 6.5 billion people that can still buy phones. In China, some people have two, three phones. They carry two, three phones on their belt. I mean, so there's a lot of phones, and that's why the, the competition is so fierce in the phone business, because there's a lot of phones still to be sold. Even less with, uh, that's with regular phones. I'm t I got ahead of myself. That's with regular phones, let alone cellular phones. Uh, even less with the internet. So that's why the, the, everybody's so hot to be in the internet business, because there's literally millions, billions of internet uh, laptops, exactly, uh, ex laptops that can be sold. By 2050, the population of the planet of Earth will double. So there's going to be 13 billion looking for internet, 13 billion looking for cell phones, wow. stationary phones. I mean, it's a huge market. So when I said telecommunication 25 years ago, you know, and healthcare, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a prodigy, but I knew what I was talking about. Among the fast-growing companies, 95% of the failures are due to internal problems. Of the companies that evaporated, of those Fortune 500 companies that have come and gone, come and uh, went, most of them left because of internal problems. They couldn't adapt, as Darwin would say from Galapagos, they couldn't adapt. And they couldn't adapt to a lot of things. And they, they, a lot of people blame it on interest rates, this, that, and the other thing. Now they're blaming global warming. You know, but there's always a reason to, that, as Freud would say, intellectual reason to come up with to, uh, for your excuse or your failure to be able to manage and adapt. And it, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Annual market for U.S. small companies for sale is estimated at over $200 billion a year. Hmm. Now, 95% of these companies don't sell. Why don't they sell, Dave? Because they don't try to sell no, that's part. Because they want too much money. You, like you. And why do they want too much money for their fucking company, the little Rufus Doofus lumber mill? Why do they want too much money? Because they have not had a history, a life of a series of transactions. They're all trying to get rich off one motherfucking deal. They waste their whole fucking life. Sweetheart. <laughs> they, they, they waste their whole fucking life and then they decide to sell because they're spitting up blood <coughs> with emphysema and now they want to sell. And they pray to God, Buddha or Allah, that it's time to sell now. Well, invariably, when you're spitting up blood, it's not time to sell. So if I come in and you're spitting up blood, it's a bad sign because I'm not going to feel sorry for you. When I used to sell life insurance and I'd sit in the kitchen tables with Mr. and Mrs. Doofus, and she's smoking, spitting up blood, and he's not spitting up blood yet, but he's smoking. I said, these are perfect for high premiums. These people are perfect, you know. Uh, Allah sent me to them. Because we all wait until it's too fucking late. If you're 40 years old and you're up market, sell. That's been my advice for a long, long time, and it still is my advice. Yes? One question. Uh, you know the numbers of my company. Correct. Um, is it right to blow them up? and sell it, uh, I don't know, in a half a year or in, a, in one year, it's better to sell it now. Oh, it, it, it's, it's better. Is your market in an up market, a flat market, or a down market? The then, industry then, you're in. Uh, it's, it's 
slowly up. Okay. okay. Five percent. What's five percent? What was it five years ago? The same. Okay. What What is it projected to be five years from now? Nearly the same, I think. Nearly the same. Okay. Know. Well, it depends. If you have something, be if you have find something better to do, forgetting your brother and your father, if you have find something better to do, take the cash and do something else. Because if, if it's a it's in a, in a slowly increasing market, nothing's going to change much. But that would give you maybe uh, that would give you a year to sell it. I mean, to do the things that we're going to talk about, how to sell a company on Friday. My my company can uh, can grow faster because I implemented some things that uh, we are cheaper than the other one in the, in the production. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but I think I have to blow it up by myself. I think I have to blow it up around about a half a year or one a year. Maybe I can double the the and then the, sell the revenue. The and then sell. And then sell. Yeah. I think. Okay. Well, when we talk about selling Friday, you'll see. Okay. Okay. And more and more and more the, of the 6.5 billion people around the world will buy soft drinks. It's another area I like, but I don't like as much as healthcare and telecommunication. But everybody's buying soft drinks. You go to India, there's Pepsi Cola every place. You go. I mean, soft drinks because they want you know they they, they want to uh, westernize themselves. What about the powders? Huh? The, the powders, the sodas, the waters, the energy no, drinks? No, no, I mean, the, the uh, energy drinks are way down the totem pole. They, 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 have, they, have, they represent a small percentage of Coca-Cola, etc. People still want to put their hand on a can or a bottle. And so we're looking for worldwide markets that make sense. Telecommunication, healthcare, you know, you know everybody's, uh, I, I don't like to call this junk food, but it is junk food. Because Coke and that shit's not good for you. Um, and uh, Diet Coke and Diet shit is even worse for you. But, I mean, there are certain things that are going to continue to grow no matter what. I'm not saying that they're recession-proof, <coughs> but they're pretty close to being recession-proof. They're pretty close. People are going to buy cell phones. People are going to buy laptops. People are going to try to save their lives at the hospital, irrespective of uh, recession or depression. The market cap for real estate investment trusts industry has gone from nine billion in 1990 to 100 billion in 1997 to 350 billion by the end of 2000. <laughs> well, it's already passed. Uh, I think uh, it'll be four trillion in 10 to 15 years. Okay, a real estate investment trust is a public company that owns real estate assets that, by uh, by um, law, has to pay out 90 or 96 percent of all their dividends. Yearly, it's a real estate investment trust, and Sam Zell, the guy from Chicago, the billionaire guy from Chicago, is uh, the guy that uh, is big in that industry. So, the the real estate market, dividend paying real estate market, is going to be larger and larger. But now they're paying less and less. So, whereas they may have bought uh, a billion, uh, a trillion dollars worth of real estate, now they're buying a trillion dollars worth of estate for half a trillion dollars. But that's not changing the market. I mean, people are still doing real estate investment trusts. So real estate is, is going to be a good market, a growing market, but I mean, right now, all the prices are down. So people that have cash are picking those pieces of real estate up. Every time somebody sells a property at a loss, somebody's buying it at a profit. So just because you weren't smart enough to know when to get out of the real estate market or not get into the real estate market, there are people that were smart enough. As I told you, the kids of today are going to experience six or seven career changes, not different jobs. Six or seven career changes. That's why I say you kids can do six or seven deals before your time's up. Sweetheart here is running out of runway. <laughs> She's running out of runway. Not not my standing her new looks. She's running out of runway. And so am I, you know, running out of runway. But you guys certainly aren't. The skill with a maximum shelf life is creativity. We're talking about growth. What do you have that differentiates you from everybody else? How can you participate in this growth market? You know, uh, Rick Scott, I told him 25 years ago, telecommunications are healthcare, Rick. He took healthcare, created the biggest healthcare company in the world. Made a lot of money. Made a shit ton of money, yeah. And now, he's buying his way to politics. God bless you. <laughs> And when you're governor of Florida and we're down there, we're going to be paying him a visit. Okay. Paying him a visit. Rick, 
So. Is that the person uh, on one of your tapes who was uh, explaining how donuts are made? Donuts, that's him. That's him? That's Rick. Donuts, he's a Dunkin' Donut man. One of the cheapest white men that I ever knew. I told you, he bought a Buick, 77 Buick, he didn't have a radio in it because he said it was too expensive. So he bought it without it. I don't know anybody, well, I know, I do know, Bunker Hunt didn't have a radio in his car either. But I mean, and he's a billionaire. He put a little transistor radio and hung it on a string over the rear view mirror. He was close with his money. I hear he's still close. So hey, for him to spend $40 million on being governor, I mean, he must have figured it out pretty well that, you know, $40 million. Okay. Ma ma the maximum shelf life is creativity. Okay, what is growth? Notwithstanding all the shit that's happened uh, with the stock market, if you go back to 1902-1900, this is the Dow Jones, up till about uh, uh, a few months ago. And uh, the Depression here in the 20s, early 30s, but it's pretty much gone up. It's pretty much gone up. And uh, the, uh, it almost got the 14,000 14, back in 2008, and now it's back to 11,000. Okay, and this is the kind of growth that people expect. But this is arithmetic growth. This is, if, if you take this and you adjust it for inflation, I mean, it's like 8% or 9% you know, a year. If you don't adjust it for inflation, it's 13% a year or something. So, but as, you know, and, and everybody would be happy if everybody's assets were invested here. But unfortunately, they were invested here and sold here, they were invested here and sold here, they were invested here and sold here, they were invested here and sold here. Okay. Uh, Doris can tell you a little bit about that at dinner. Okay. So, but th that's normal, that's normal growth, and it, if you can wait, if you've got 110 years to wait, no problem, just slap it into an index fund and wait. And you, you, the young kids can't wait. They can wait 50 years, but they certainly can't wait 110 years. Okay. But this is what we were raised with. This is the thought process. This is our, the gene pool that we came out of. The U.S. National Debt Clock. This was, this was for the last seminar. We, we had $12.8 trillion in um, debt. We had 308 million people in America. We had... Uh, each share of debt to each citizen was $41,000. The national debt has continued to increase an average of 4.1 billion per day. Okay. And what's Congress doing? Nothing. They're just jerking off. It doesn't include Social Security. No, no, no. Okay, now, now, uh, now we have 309 million people. Now debt's gone from 41 to 44,000 per person in, the, in America. The national debt continued to increase an average of 4.18 billion, up from 4.11 billion. Per day since uh, September 28, 2007. Thanks. So this is also growth. <laughs> this is also growth. Robert and I wish that we had an index on this, and we, you know, we had some money on it. You know. I've actually seen some statistics that show this doesn't include Social Security and a few other things. No, it's actually not 75 trillion. Yeah, it could be. It could, I don't know that. As a nation, the U.S. the USA borrowed 2.5 trillion per year without mortgages. The average USA family has nine credit cards. Nine. That's also growth. You used to not have any credit cards. Worst okay. new home sales records on record in USA. Worst foreclosure rate in all of history. U.S. economy is in bad shape, and that's an understatement. And it's only going to get worse before it gets better, which is true. He's a smart guy. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, he is. The business findings have gone uh, uh, up to 1.2 million non-business, 1.15 million uh, business, 49,000. So the business, these, these people, the business finding bankruptcy. Oh, I understand. Bankruptcy. Um, this is also growth. People always ask me, Dan, how, how can you buy somebody's debt? You know, I say in the tapes, you can buy somebody's debt even if they don't want to sell. You know, I say, you know, I told your dad, I told everybody to listen. Well, this is an example. Carl Icahn is buying up all the cards, still smarting from the flop gamble uh, on uh, Blockbuster. The billionaire investor yesterday upped the ante in his uh, showdown with developer Donald Trump over ownership of three bankrupt Trump casinos in Atlantic City. Icon quietly gained control yesterday of the half of the casino's mortgage 
that he uh, didn't already own. He bought back the half of the mortgage held by Texas banker Alan Beal, uh, a requirement of one of the covenants of the original mortgage deal. So he's bought the debt up. And people say, you can't buy the Bullshit, you can't. You can even buy debt if it's not in foreclosure. If the bank doesn't like Dave, and apparently they don't like Dave, and I go to his bank in, 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 in uh, Reno. She loves me. Huh? She loves me. Okay, well, and, and I say, I'm willing to pay you uh, $1.25 for every dollar of debt that he owes you. There's a fair chance that she sell it to me. Then now you owe me the debt. The question I was going to ask is, you call possible? Me? And now I call the loan. Uh, is it possible to um, make sure that there is a, a clause in that new loan that precludes them from selling it to anybody? No. Why? They, they just they won't well, do that. You know, why because it, you it, buy it, debt? Be, be, why would I buy debt? Because it can t- it control of assets. The same reason Carl Carl Eichen wanted to control you know uh, the debt out of bankruptcy, and he didn't want to take the chance uh, uh, buying the assets out of bankruptcy. So he's going to take, just take the debt because. It, it, to tell the bank they can't sell your debt is like saying you can't collateralize your debt. And that, nobody does that because they have the ability to collateralize your debt, roll it up into a big package, securitize it, and sell it on to somebody else. That gives them more viable opportunities to make fees. It gives them more viable opportunities to change their risk profile. Is so there a reputation at stake? Is there, is there a- Not for your loan. They'd be glad to get rid of your loan. But like you guys were saying at uh, lunch before, if Google knows you're doing good, you're in fucking trouble because they can just come in and jack you. Yeah, well, I mean, you don't want Google to know your name. Better, but I mean, as soon as you start making big money, Google knows your name. That's why he's not. It's and you know, you, it's not like you can keep it a secret. Well, the internet marketing business. What's yeah, but what is big money? Like, uh, I don't. I mean, in, 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 I don't know what big money, but I mean, if you're making. Uh, a half a million dollars a day, that's, you know, that's, there's not that many people making a half a million dollars a day in Google. You know, there's probably not that many people making a hundred thousand dollars a day in Google. And so your, your head pops up and, you know, because they want Google to be for the masses. That's why they continue to change a lot algorithms, because they want it to be for the masses, a mass marketing. They want, you know, 300 guys to make a trillion dollars off of it. So they can come in and look at Robert's company and say, guy's making a lot of money. I want to, I want to buy it. I, 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 no, no, they, they, they're not going to want to buy it. They'll just shut it down. They'll just shut it, whack his account. They'll just shut it down, whack it, and you know, and he's fucked. Oh. And they can do that? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. They do it every week. I don't understand how they can do that, though. They can because you operate, part of the operating agreement on Google is you're there at their, at their behest. I mean, you have to play the game. It's like when you go to a website and it says, have you read all this shit? Click yes. And if you don't read all that shit, you can't get on. Mm-hmm. When you get on the Google thing, you're playing by their rules. Right. And they have the ability to change the rules whenever they want. Mm-hmm. So why would they go after him if he's making too much money? Because they want, because that means if he's making too much money, that means there's 50,000 people that aren't making as much money. And they want rather have millions and millions and millions of billions of people make about the same than uh, four or five guys, you know, make big money. It's for the masses. Right? Yeah, it's for the masses. Yeah. I still don't understand the debt part. Why would somebody go in and buy debt for 125 percent? Somebody's debt. Because the assets that it, that is Seriously. securing it is worth 500 percent. Oh, okay. Well, then that makes sense. Okay. Okay, guys. Okay. Okay. Carl wanted to buy Trump's casinos. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. And, it, and that was more of a personal pissing match. You, you know. took him? Huh? You took him? Yeah, I took him. Okay. Here's more growth. It's, you're going to notice all these slides that we're going to spend a lot of time on are all bad growth. This is not good growth. This is bad growth. Uh, U.S. government spending, federal plus state and local, over the last 130 years. Wow. Now, the interesting thing to know, the only person that slowed it down was Ronald Reagan. Hmm. 80. And then it's kind of flattened out and it's going up again. I couldn't get a new chart, but he slowed it down. Ronnie. The Gipper slowed it down. So, he, you know, you may not think of much of him, and you may say a lot of bad things about him. I don't. But, I mean, he slowed it down. He's the, he's the only guy since 1913 that slowed it down. Federal spending grows eight times faster than the economy. 19, you know, pre-New Deal, which is, means pre-Depression. Uh, uh, New Deal was Depression, FDR. Uh, 1940, and then uh, 2009. Grandfather federal spending 
Oh, that's the grandfather of the federal spending report. Uh, eight times faster than the economy. Um, state and local government employees grow 12.4 million, fa million faster than total population growth rate. I mean, again, since 1945, since I was born. I mean, these are all staggering numbers. And you wonder why people say things are fucked. Well, there's a reason things are fucked. I mean, and there's a reason some of us don't live in the country anymore. Uh, this is the U.S. economy from 47 as opposed to today. And the interesting thing about it is, um, back in 47, the government was only involved in 16% of business. Now the government is involved in 51% of the business. And if Obamacare and that shit doesn't get thrown out, they're going to be involved in more than 51% of the business. Uh. Country. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people that say that. Yeah. Growing burden of seniors. Senior citizens like myself, poor and helpless people. <laughs> that barely, and it's soon to be heard in another 10 years or 12 years. I mean, they can barely eke out a living. They barely pay for some, you know, beans and bread on this, on this thing. Poor, poor me. And U.S., Britain, and Germany, and Japan are all in the same state. In fact, Germany has overtaken uh, Japan. And, uh, and the U.S. has uh, fallen behind uh, Britain. So, uh, I mean, it's the burden of seniors. And there are, and the burden of seniors worldwide is shit. And that's why there's rioting in France and rioting in Spain and rioting in Greece because <laughs> they're making these bastards work from 55 to 59 or 62 to 60. Now, what's going to happen when they see the retirement age in the United States goes from 65 to 67? Do you think there's going to be riots in the street? Nah. They're not going to set anybody on fire or anything like that, like these other countries. I hope. Government spending, again, per man, per woman, from uh, the total. I mean, uh, the, the numbers are, are gigantic. Grandfather, let's see, America's total debt. Right, this is an old number. Um, which was at that time was current 70 times more than the, than the debt of 1957. Wow. Where does all this money go? Not in the movie business. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, total, uh, again to total, total American debt, 48 trillion. I mean, it is all these not, this is what we, you know, and this is what, what we've been taught. Of course, they, nobody's putting these charts up and nobody tells you about this in school. And even though I, I went to school a long, long time ago, um, the, uh, and I looked at my economics books of my son who just got his MBA and they don't talk about any of this shit. Mm -hmm. I like Roger Dangerfield's one when he's sitting in the class and he goes, that's not the way you do it. you got to grease some hands. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and certainly my, my son didn't learn any of this shit. You know. He knows it because he's read the seminar and he's read the book and all this other shit. And I've been preaching about the debt was going to collapse since 1993, and of course I was 15 years early, and everybody said, oh, Pena, if, if you start crying, you're, you're, even a broken watch is right twice a day. But I, I didn't get killed like everybody else, or most everybody else, because I just didn't believe, you know, I didn't believe enough that I, I could invest in them. I had a lot of uh, equity investment opportunities, and, um, uh, and other opportunities I didn't take advantage. This is uh, components of total American debt. Uh, basically, says the same thing. Uh, this is a, this one's another way of looking at it. Uh, total American debt percent national income. I mean, the numbers are going uh, you know catastrophically high. This is a, a number scary one. Dollar of debt per dollar of national income. It's way out of whack. Okay. Now this is another one, but this is a reverse bad. Diminishing national income return on debt. Okay, it used to be 55 cents, now it's below 20 cents. Household debt ratio, going off the charts. Now, an idea gets rejected not because it isn't fundamentally sound, but because no one in top management will personally benefit from it. I said this earlier, I think in Monday. A lot of ideas, not a lot, some ideas, there's no idea, really, there's no way of measuring how many ideas get rejected. Um, that um, could change the course of the world. You know, you don't know. 25% of uh, all startups start with less than 5,000 pounds. That should be dollars, excuse me. 
50% start with less than $25,000, 75% start with less than $100,000, and less than 5% uh, with more than a million dollars. That should also be dollars. Um, and uh, why is that? Because most companies, you know, these companies anyway, actually from here, 75% uh, are, um, are with friends, fools, and family, as we'll see. Uh, 10 of the Fortune 500 companies that started with next to nothing, these are current ones. Uh, Whole Foods Market, zero. Uh, Molson Coors, zero. Um, Apple, 81,000. Uh, Nordstrom's, zero. Uh, Dell, $12,000. Uh, Electronic Data Systems, uh, about a thousand bucks. Mattel, about a thousand bucks. Wrigley, zero. Starbucks, zero. eBay, less than two thousand, or no, excuse me, eBay's at the other end, uh, 10,000 bucks. Next to nothing. And those became Fortune 500 companies. And they are Fortune 500 companies. Stock option magic at Microsoft. I'm not going to read this, but as I've been telling you ad nauseum since Monday, only reason that Bill Gates started the company was to be able to share ownership. Share ownership because that's the secret to real growth. Did some of the people leave Bill? Yes. Does it make a fuck? No. Starbucks secret weapon. The company has given the stock option to everyone, from managers to baristas. Now employees see a connection between their work and Starbucks fortune. Fortunes. Value of stock options. From 1984 to 1997, the value of stock options in the U.S. public companies has grown from $200 million to over $1.2 billion, or over 600%, and from 1997 to 2008, it has grown to $100 billion. And a lot of companies, a lot of people have left the companies. It's not just Silicon Valley, because everybody thinks it's Silicon Valley, okay? Morgan Stanley, 91% of their stock is, is given away to the public uh, options. Merrill Lynch, 40%. Travelers Insurance, 39%. Warner Lambert, 35%. Microsoft, 32%. J.P. Morgan, 26 29%. Lehman Brothers, which is gone now, uh, 28%. U.S. Airways, which is also gone, 26%. Sun Microsystems, 25%. Marriott, 25%. Bankers Trust, General Mills, MCI, blah, blah, blah. Those are big, huge percentages of big, huge companies that they were giving away in stock options. Why do they do it? Do they do it because they want to be Mr. Generous, like, you know, Mr. Russian here? No. They do it because it fucking works! Because these people wouldn't give you ice in fucking winter! Like, Dave. If you send them, send them to Hawaii for 300 bucks or send them to Manila for 800 bucks and give them 200 bucks to spend, pales in complexion to this system. And if I had any intelligence whatsoever, which I have a lot, but I really, when I, when I gave away stock and stock options, I mean, it was easily one of the smartest things I ever did. Easily one of the smartest things I ever did. Because they start working like it's their business. And of course you're going to make mistakes. And of course you're going to get some prick that's no good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's really never happened to me. So 91% of Morgan Stanley's stock, total issue not standing stock, yeah. is in the form of stock options. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Quantum leap. Sudden, sudden highly significant advanced breakthrough. This is a study. Quantum mechanics note that particles make these jumps without an apparent effort and without covering all the bases between the starting and the ending points. So it's you know, possible in physics. Quantum leaps required to take the offensive. You can't achieve exponential gains and success from a defensive posture. Remember, you can't also from a defensive posture because the blood didn't enter the brain. Remember we went through all that shit? Okay. You, can, you can't remain in a passive stance and make a quantum leap. A quantum leap is a move you're prepared to make, you just haven't done it yet. This is a concept that some, some of the people get and some people don't. The person that got it the quickest ever that I ever had a seminar, not the most successful, but the person that got it the quickest and understood what I was getting at was Sean Casey. When we brought the whole team there 
for Legrand. He sat in the back of the room after I told everybody, most of you are going to be gone, you're worthless pieces of shit, yada yada. And, 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 and I went around and he's leaning back, he wasn't, looks like he wasn't paying attention. And Sean's a really smart guy, he's a smart lawyer. And he said, I got it, I'm going to be here. Yeah, I can see where all these morons won't be here. And these are his buddies sitting around the table. He says, well, I got it. And he did get it. He understood. He understood the leverage. And he understood, more importantly, the leverage with people. It's commonly held that there is such a thing as the creative spark, writes Hofstetter in Scientific American. Any of you read Scientific American? I didn't think so. Anyway. That when a brilliant mind comes to up with a new idea or work of art, there has been a quantum leap of ordinary mortals. People such as Mozart are held uh, to be somewhat, somehow divinely inspired. They have magical insights. But I contend that the creative spark is not the exclusive property of a few uh, rare individuals, but rather part of everyday mental activity of everyone, even the most ordinary people. I agree with that. But you've got to be looking for it. You're not just walking down the street waiting for that bolt of lightning to hit you or the Pope to jump out in front of you. You gotta look for it and you gotta train your mind for it. Like we were talking about, Tom Edison said, I didn't have 10,000 failures, I just had 10,000 things that didn't work. So what do these other things work for? How should planning occur? We're talking about growth again. The boss sets the goals that everyone follows or you ask the lower level employees to state their objectives then move the plan up to the next level until it reaches the top. Obviously B is the answer. But you've got to have the right people. If you don't have the right people, this doesn't work. This is called management by objectives. If you don't have the right people, it doesn't work. It just flat ass doesn't work. You know? Now, I was privileged to be in the CEO's office of Reebok, which is makes tennis shoes or training shoes, with the CEO. And uh, he was on a board of mine that I was chairman of. When I was also in the entertainment business, come to think of it, I've been in entertainment business more than I remember. <laughs> anyway, uh, we were in Boston, and we had the head of the math department of uh, Harvard, and we had all these uh, rocket signs around the room. And but when I was in his office, I went over to meet him at lunch, and I saw him. What's this? And he said, uh, "That's my uh, plan. That's my uh, three-year plan." I said, "For what?" That's my three-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's, that's my three-year plan for, for turning around Reebok. Oh, Jesus. And I went up and looked at it, <laughs> and, it was, and I said, uh, then he explained it to me. I said, okay. I said, well, who did you use this for? And I said, I brought in my directs. That means the people that reported him directly, and my division heads. And we sat down in a room like this, and I went, and I drew it as I'm talking. Like this. And I told him, this is how we were going to reform, transform, whatever you want to call it, Reebok, to compete better with Adidas and uh, Nike. I said, can I have this? So I rolled it up and took it home, because this is what I believe. But it's hard, and this guy is an MBA from MIT, the Sloan School. This guy is a rocket scientist. And I said, can I, can I? I said, yeah, 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 it doesn't mean shit, you know, I can do it again. And... Um, and I said, how long did it take? It took me about 20, 25 minutes. And then we had a, a, maybe a, two hours of questions, and that was it. And I said, okay, doofus, uh, run with that, and Marcus, and Benjamin, and Mikey, and well, what about all the benchmarks, and the projections, and the this, and the that? And... <laughs> there weren't any. There weren't any. Do as much as you can as soon as humanly possible. Yeah, just get out there and fucking do it. You know, you know if you get in a problem, let me know. But I, you, hopefully you won't have any problems. Just go out and hit the road. Don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. And this is one method of pumping up the end game. In other words, pumping up your efficiency. You, you know, Because a lot of people, you can't just put that chart up there and you scribble it because they go, eh, you know. And so you have to institute, you know, of course, processes. And now, with that thing that he had there, came processes, procedures, and systems. They came after the fact, not before the fact. Okay, now, scope out the end game. You want to be able to tell your people what the end game is. And 
and you want, uh, will the decision enhance your company's reputation or gradually undermine it? In other words, they have to understand that what the, the process that they're involved in is going to help the business, it's going to help the company, it's going to help even their project. You want to have a media check, write three or four potential headlines, positive and negative. Now this is for bigger companies, for smaller companies you don't need a media check. Uh, the secretary, strategy check. The strategy check. Ghosts. <laughs> yeah. The strategy check. Uh, decisions often make good tactical sense, but fail the strategy check. In other words, you made a business decision. You understand that structure follows strategy. In other words, you put down a strategy, we're going to do this. For example, we're going to do government contracts. Okay. Now, what's the structure we're going to attach to most efficiently attack the government contract market? We know the government contracts are bid in February and October. Okay? I believe their year end is in October. It used to be. So we passed the October deadline, so now we've got to get ready for the first six months, the February deadline. So we're going to scope out, uh, you know, and now I'm sure it's all online. I'm positive. In my day, you fill out forms this thick. Um, and um, so we'll uh, associate the structure to follow up on our strategy decision and make sure that we're not doing anything to alienate that. And then we need our people that are going to actually do the, the grunt work, the footwork, to understand it and to push it forward. Does the decision offer a quick fix that could hamper your competitiveness later? Um, this isn't a quick fix. This is going to be an intermediate and a long-term deal. Because once you get one government contract, it's easy to get the next contract, the next contract. But as soon as, and we're going to, part of our, our due diligence, our homework is going to find out, are there anybody else in your business, soon to be our business, that is doing this? Because if not, as soon as she does it, there'll be three million people doing it. Because it's a small industry. As soon as it gets out in a trade paper that she won this contract, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to be doing government contracts. Fortunately, the government, being stupid as they are, yes, I say, fortunately for the government, being stupid as they are, <laughs> The, the people that get on board first will have a distinct advantage. They call it first mover's advantage. And I will be running around the country saying how fucking hard it is to do business with the government. Sending out misinformation. Just like the fucking politicians do. We may have to scratch this part of the tape out. Just like the, just like the politicians do. We will be engaged in misinformation. God, am I sorry we ever got involved in this. We ain't going to make a fucking nickel on this contract. I mean, that door is an old fucking hand. She's crazy. I don't know how she ever got involved in this piece of shit. Etc. 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 You know, because we don't want anybody. And by the time they, they figure out that Penny may be exaggerating again, <laughs> and maybe it's not, and maybe it's not that hard. And you know, the monkeys are getting into business. They even got into business. You know. And you, you, you want to turn these, these ideas, like I just alluded to, to teachable moments that are people that are already there. Uh, and um, you, know, you want them to unite on the strategy so we're all rowing in the same direction. Now, I never had any problem handling the truths, but associates who don't agree with decisions being made have a responsibility to speak up. Remember I talked about candor? Remember I talked about Jack Welch as the biggest problem in business today, not just in there, but in Germany, every place is candor, because people won't speak up. Now that has never been my problem. I've always spoke up, and I got chastised a lot of times for it, and that's why I didn't get hired by Carnation, and that's why I didn't get hired by uh, Scott Paper, because they knew that I was going to be speaking up too much, so they just forgot about hiring me. Okay. The loyalty and criticism are mutually supportive. Slavish loyalty is deadly. You don't want somebody, and I'm sure you've got some loyal slaves that are just doing anything. So we want them to understand why they're doing it. So even though they're a loyal slave and they're good foot soldiers, you know, we don't want them falling on any swords. We want them to understand and benefit both emotionally and financially. You want to build a brain trust um, of smart people. You want Every business needs three, four, five, six smart people that you can bounce ideas off of. And you can, you know, interchange and not get pissed off if somebody says that's a dumb idea. It can be more difficult when your brothers and fathers and shit like that, believe me, I understand, even though I've never done any business with my dad, but I've been in organizations with fathers, sons, daughters, and it's, it's not easy. It's not impossible, but it's not easy. Uh, avoid the bait and switch. In other words, 
if you're going to start in game A, stay in game A. Don't start them in game A and then switch them over because they're, they're middle management or lower management, they're not going to be able to cope. Especially in the Philippines, they're not going to be able to cope. Uh, this results when supervisors take a great game, uh, promise, self-management, and then uh, later renege. You can't renege. You, you, if, even if it costs you, you got to follow through, and you can't renege. This is a 21st century feedback chart that, that uh, ties in employee satisfaction, client satisfaction, or the customer satisfaction, profitability, and motivation. And according to this, they all equal or equally weighted. I don't believe that, but you know, they're all equally weighted. Maybe at um, uh, some great company, uh, that was voted in the, the top ten, maybe they are equally weighted. But my experience has been that this rules profitability. And the second thing that rules uh, is client satisfaction. And I would rather have profitability and client satisfaction and, you know, and uh, uh, maybe less motivation. But if you don't keep them motivated, you're not going to have client satisfaction. Okay? And uh, if you don't have employee satisfaction, and that means you're not going to be motivated, you're not going to have client satisfaction. So even though these two things are the most important to me, profitability and client satisfaction, you have to take into consideration uh, uh, employee satisfaction and motivation. Now, as Sam Walton said, you know, the customer tells you by spending his money whether he still likes you or not, and he can give it to anybody, including the chairman or the CEO. So infinitely, if you don't have enough client satisfaction, I mean, um, your, your market share will, will dry up, your business will dry up, and you don't have um, uh, much to look forward to. Now, and something we find difficult, uh, except for a few top people in, uh, in the Philippines, for an example, since Doris knows that market, feedback. You know, you give expectations. You make adjustments. And they're supposed to deliver. Well, they can't take too many adjustments. They can't take too many adjustments. And they really can't take too high expectations because they rate themselves against other Filipinos. They don't rate themselves against... Um, oh, you can close the window now. It's too dark. Okay. 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 No, no. Okay, let's sit over there. It's better. Yeah. Okay. They, don't, they rate themselves not against uh, Cleveland or, or, or California or New Mexico, they rate themselves against other Filipinos. And the expectation in the Filipino market is not that high. That's because their self-esteem isn't that high. Um, of course, you've got to have reporting. You've got to have, you've got to monitor. Things that get measured gets accomplished. Um, and you have to establish success criteria, milestones, roles, tasks, status reporting, incentives, Goals, targets, resources, responsibilities, estimates, the plan budget. But then you got to hold them accountable. You can go through all this and jerk off all you want, but if you don't hold them accountable, and if Department A doesn't do what they're supposed to, and, De and Department B doesn't do what they're supposed to, and this, they don't, then this is all a circle jerk. This is an MBA circle jerk. You got to hold them accountable. And there's always a reason why not to hold them accountable. Transfer of knowledge. You know, that's Robert's favorite. Transfer of knowledge. You know, we can't just fire everybody today because we've got all this knowledge transfer. Um, and, and sometimes he's right about it, but I, I think most of the time that that's not true. And in certain areas and, you know, programming and stuff like that, maybe it is true. Uh, but fortunately, I don't know enough about programming to know if it's true or not. And so I can make some decisions that I don't give a shit about transfer of knowledge. We're firing you. So, you know. um, but you've got to hold them accountable. If you don't hold them accountable, Man, this is just pissing in the wind. And I've, I've, I've dealt with some really smart guys and gals that have MBAs and PhDs and all this shit. But when it comes down to accountability, because they, they rank on the pessimism, optimism, and success test, they're too much of pussies. And it's not right to fire people. And it's not right to enjoy firing people. And if you enjoy firing, you've got to get out of the business. But you're there for a return on investment. You have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. And if you can't do them, then get the fuck off the bus. 
And I think, you know, one, one of the things that brought this home to me the most is when I helped to manage a fund, you know, many years ago. I mean, the shareholders weren't interested in, you know, the reason I didn't do something or I did do something. The shareholders were only interested in the return on investment. All the rest is bullshit. It's all bullshit. Okay, any questions on this? And we're still talking about growth. The CEO cannot delegate strategic planning system, which is the top team, control and accountability system, systems to grow managers, and care and feeding of the corporate culture. Uh, I said, uh, I don't know if Robert was in the room, I have had, I've had an open door policy all my life since I was a CEO of a public company 20 plus years ago. And very few people come into my office to talk to me. And then I forced people in, in hindsight, it was wrong. I forced, pe I forced six people to have lunch with me once a month. And my office had a big, huge office, had a big conference thing with big, you know. And so six people would come in to have lunch with me once a month. And my assistant, God lover, Leanne Zichelli, would always sit in on the lunch. She says, you know, you, 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 I know you need a witness just in case you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so she used to come in. And I heard... There's not enough good-looking guys in the office. Uh, the girls are too easy. Uh, can we put a steam bath in the... Uh, I, I built a gym in the office. We had 48,000 square feet. I built a gym so they wouldn't have to take as much time going to... They didn't have first fitness and that shit. Then a gym. Then I built a staircase between the uh, 17th and 18th floor. Because I let some jerks convince me, a time and motion study, that all the time they wasted having to just wait in the elevator, all this shit. So I built a staircase, you know, between the floors. Uh, and, uh, and all kinds of stuff, you know. You know, uh, to, you know how does your wife ever come into town, Mr. Pena? This is from women, you know. And uh, well, it's none of your business how often my wife is here. Don't you get lonely, Mr. Pena? I said, no, I don't get lonely. That's why I have a bath and a shower in my office so I can sleep here. You know, so I, I cut out the forced lunches and then I used to have quarterly dinners for the employees of the quarter, employees of the month. And I did all that. I set up a pension fund for the, uh, um, not pension, a uh, college scholarship fund, both for the kids that were going to go off to college and then the, the coal miners told me, and the drilling people told me, well, Dan, not everyone's going to go off to college. Can we have a trade? for a trade, they learn a trade to be a plumber and that kind of stuff. We set up that. We did all the stuff the human resource books say. But at the end of the day, we had a baseball team, we had a badminton team, we had a soccer team, we had a basketball team, uh, I don't know what else, we had, we had uh, fishing trips, we had picnics, we had all kind of shit that you can think of. But at the end of the day, the thing that motivated them the most was fucking the money. The money. When I gave somebody a 40% bonus or an 80% bonus, and they, and bless you, and they could buy a new vacation home or they could do this and that, that was like, you know, lightning in their ear. So in hindsight, I, I could cut back on a lot of stuff, and it, those plans cost us several hundred thousand dollars a year, all that shit. It wasn't <coughs> shit, because we did good. But I mean, we could have done less of that and maybe given more bonuses and more stock options, because we gave a lot of stock options. But the corporate culture is something that I participated a lot in. And they like me with this, being there till 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night more than anything. They like me humping it more than anything. And it made, you know, on Saturday or Sunday, 40, 50, 60 percent of the employees would be in the office. They didn't get paid overtime. I mean, do you have a, an ironclad belief uh, or policy that you follow when it comes to... Uh, um Shoot first and ask questions later. That's one of my ironclad policies. That's a good one. Um, so, shoot first and ask questions later. And when an employee comes to you and uh, asks you for a raise, uh, my policy is never ask me for a raise. You know, if you're going to try to put some kind of ultimatum, you're gone immediately. Uh, I will let you know beforehand that uh, there will be no requests for a raise and raises are due when uh, bonuses are due. All, all the stuff is subjective and, um, you know, do good and, and you'll be rewarded. What do you do when employees come? Well, I've never had, in, in 39 years, an employee's never asked me for a raise. 
But then yeah. they would, 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 would Well, what I'd say is normally, because these guys don't report to me, well, first of all, they'd have to go through their supervisor, the VP of this, and that, and the human resources, and they never get to me. But if they did get to me, I'd say, uh, you know, your question's out of line. I'm sure you're a hard worker, uh, but uh, you go talk to, you know, in one company I talk to, say, go talk to Ruth, who's the head of human resources. But what they, what they do say, what, what, what do they say? What's their policy? What, what's the policy that you make them enforce? Oh, the policy they have enforced, they have to go through their supervisor. But it's okay to ask for a raise? Yeah, no, you can say, you know, no, I, I don't put it that way. It's all right for the employees to say, how are we doing? How's the business doing? If the business is doing shit and they still ask for a raise, something ain't right. The business is going good. And, you, you know, I'm on television getting the uh, CEO award of, uh, uh, for Texas. I mean, it's not wrong for them to think the business is going good. Okay, and if the business is going good, and it's, um, or in our case, we were a public company, all they had to do was look at our earnings, you know. And my, my compensation was a public record, and the compensation of the board is public record. So they knew if uh, Governor Kerry's board director's fees went up 70% last year, the company must be doing good. So in my case, they they, they, they know. But if they were going to ask, it, you know, I, I would do feedback and training. Is the company doing well? And I told the employees, if the company's doing well, you can expect to do well. If the company's not doing well, we'll do everything humanly possible that you don't lose your job, but you know, you can't expect uh, to raise. And another thing that I'm really adamant about, and a lot of people don't agree with me, if Benedict is a plumber, and the plumbers get $18 an hour, no matter whether you're a plumber, 10 years or 110 years, that plumber, unless he's changed his job and he goes back for other training and becomes something else, can't expect to get more than $18 an hour. I don't give a fuck if he's there 60 years. And too many companies, especially small companies, because they've been there 10, 15, 30 years, they pay too much. They pay too much. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that's right. In this, this country, this world that we're in up here, I mean, people have been with companies for fucking ever. And just because you're ever doesn't mean that, that you're going to pay, get a 6% raise to keep up with inflation every year for 60 years. But, but see, they're, they're, that's not how they think. They think because they've been loyal, and their definition of loyal isn't my definition of loyal. My definition of loyal is you work your 40, 50 hours a week, and you should get every, every job task given you at the beginning of the year done on time. Even if you got to come in and work 70, 80 hours some weeks, they don't do that. Without overtime. You know, do you agree to these things you're going to do? Sure, I can get those done. You're going to get them done by June. So now how, come October and they're not done. And yet I see they took two and a half weeks vacation. They, uh, they never worked more than 46 hours in a week. And, you know, one, I, I want to fire them. Uh, and certainly I'm not going to give them any bonuses or any uh, 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 raises. In addition, I don't like Christmas bonuses because then they associate it with Christmas and not with performance. And I, you know, I, I just don't like it. I think it, I think it sends the wrong message. I'm going to just sit around so I can sit around there so I can get my food basket and my, uh, my, my Christmas bonus. Well, what about performance? Uh, you know, uh, we had people... Uh, kind of voluntarily. Everybody took a 20% uh, pay cut two years ago. It's been reinstated. Because uh, uh, the uh, business was really bad. And uh, the, the way that they took a 20% pay cut is they worked 20% more hours with no overtime. And that was a nice gesture. Now, they say that I didn't force them to do it, but I would have looked very poorly upon if they didn't do it. So in that regard, I had some influence on whether they did it or not. But um, you can't expect to feed at the trough, Dave, yourself and not feed them more. But they will ask you for less bonuses and less etc. if they own options in the company, by, by definition. But then you've got to structure that properly, you've got to structure it so it's not, you're not taking advantage of them. You've got to do it the right way. But I mean, I, I don't have a chart on it, but I read some statistics a few years ago that Microsoft had virtually no overtime. 
you know, you got six million dollars worth of options, I mean, or sixty thousand dollars, depending on where you are. How can you, in good conscience, put in for overtime? I mean, it works. The system works. All these guys do it not because they're altruistic. They do it because the system works. The days of Henry Ford beating you with a baseball bat and bringing in the goons, as they used to call them, aren't here anymore. What about all these, you know, places that if you were to get people to come work for you, let's say like internships or volunteers. For free. For free. And all of a sudden one fucking dipshit comes in and you throw him out the fucking window and then he goes to the specific institution that sent you and they go, when I send you no more fucking people. But then people still come from there and then they go after you because they go, well, obviously they like working with you and your organization, but this person saying that people are fucking hanging out there working for 16 hours and... Well, interns don't get paid anyway, so yeah. interns ought to be able to work 20 hours. No, there's, there's, there's paperwork that says that they can't Okay, work. well, maybe that's why my daughter, when she was an intern, didn't work those long hours. Right. But, uh... They want to, is what I'm trying to say, but they're not allowed to, like, laws. Well, the law can't keep you from working, unless you're a child, unless you're under 16 years of age, or uh, maybe it's 18 years of age. Nobody can keep a, a 20-year-old from working... 20 hours of overtime and not get paid. It, it, you know, you, if he's a child, or she's a child, then there's laws against that. But you, it's like, it's like a, if, if Benedict works for a deal that I'm involved in, and uh, he's an intern, and he wants to learn, and I've had people come to me and work for me for a year, not get paid, I mean, he can work as many hours as he wants. What do you call him, a volunteer? Uh, well, not, in, the, in those days, what did I call him? I didn't call him intern. I might have called, I don't remember what I called them. I might have called them volunteer. Yeah. Our organization in, 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 you know, with, um, we even had uh, this case uh, where our attorney would, uh, had their staff and they were paying on salary and they were working more than 40 hours. They had an employee go soon because if you work more than 40 hours on salary, you're subject to pay that overtime. And you can have all the contract and everything, but that's really the law. We pay overtime for everything that somebody works on overtime, but I find it to be best in our organization because everybody's wanting the overtime. They want that time they have, and it's accounted for in our, our cost of organization, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I, if we had a supervisor... But you're talking about, uh, you, you're talking about paid employees, you're not talking about managers. Yes. Managers too. Absolutely. Oh, I don't pay managers overtime. There's time. a problem. They will be there if you know, and, and more likely they're going to get somebody else to handle it if if you know they're they're um, they're not being paid overtime. It, it's worked for us, Dan. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I've never seen. I won't say I've never seen, but I mean, it's less likely. I mean, managers are by definition, you know, they they they're, they're managers. They're part of the they're part of the. Uh, Solution, they're not part of the problem. And um, I'd be hard pressed to know why um, managers get overtime. No, I have managers that work from home. They don't sit there and calculate up the hours or whatever, get up during the middle of the night and stuff like that. But I'm talking about when they physically come to the office. Okay, well, if you made it work, it works. It does. That's, that's really? all right. Okay. People don't do, and I've said this many times in the last two and a half days, people don't ex uh, do what you expect. They do what you inspect with respect. They do what you do. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, back to leadership a little bit about leading from the front. Peter Drucker, uh, one of my favorites, who died a year or two ago, one of the great management consultants of all time, and he taught at Claremont in, in, in outside California, at Claremont Men's School. Uh, management by objectives works if you know the objectives. 90% of the time, they don't. And that's why the, uh, you'll find it's easy, again, we're talking about growth. You want to get people on the growth bus. If they understand why they're doing something, instead of just doing it like a robot, you'll get more growth potential out of them than if they're just doing it like a robot. Okay. And, um, and, and I've never, you know, with one or two or three exceptions in all the years I've been doing this, have found that I can give them too much information. I've often erred on the side of not giving them enough information. But I've never erred on the side of giving them too much information. Benedict, you're going to get all these slides. You get all the overheads and you get all this shit anyway. Okay. 
This is what I call the 11th step action plan. You decide on A, and how do you get A across to B? Or you're you know, on the 50 yard line, how do you punch it into the, uh, into the net? Uh, now, I'm gonna, we're gonna get to a, a four step plan that's more Mikey's kind of plan, but we're gonna start with the 11 step to begin with. Um, you identify the idea, the thing you want to accomplish. Whether it's uh, more laptops a day, uh, well, well, or a company you want to buy, whatever the hell it is. Um, then you, um, you investigate, this is you, not anybody else, you, the decision maker. You investigate the generalities. What do I mean by generalities? Okay, are we an up economy or a down economy? I mean. Uh, are we making money this quarter, not making money this quarter? Uh, are we, uh, have we expended our overdraft or we haven't expended our overdraft? I mean, uh, are we uh, poised to make an investment in something else and we should be ready? You look at the generalities of the business model. Okay. Assuming that it's, it's, it's uh, positive, then you investigate the specifics. Okay, now you look at the specific details of what it will take to get the thing done. Okay, um, we, uh, we're, uh, it's a manufacturing thing. Do we really have uh, on-site capabilities in engineering? Do we have to outsource it? Um, if we've got to outsource it, uh, you know, how much time do we have to get the bids, to get three bids? And I believe on any kind of expenditure, business expenditure, you should get at least three bids, three independent bids, so they tell you how much it's going to cost. You don't always go with a low bid, but you need three independent bids. Uh, then uh, you, uh, the commitment to the idea by you, you, okay, the first three are positive, and then you, that doesn't happen overnight. Now with me, I mean, I can do, you know, the first three in a few hours, I can figure it out because I've done so many of these things. So now you get committed, you get obsessed, this is you again, it's, you know, when you're dealing with you. This is the most fucking important thing since sliced bread, since Jesus Christ, mother and apple pie. You're not going to do anything else until this is done. Okay. Now you, br you bring in the pre uh, 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 preliminary decision, uh, you and others, you bring them in. Okay, and if you're a one-man show, you don't have anybody to bring in, you got you. It's back to you. But if you got two or three people in the deal, then you bring two or three people in the deal. And, you, and you're like a, a coach, you get them all pumped up, like a show dog. You get them all obsessed, okay. And you say, okay, we're, we're the team, we're the universe of this, getting this deal done. And so now we are going to live it totally until we get it done. Okay. And you can't have somebody working on five, six, seven different projects. Okay. This is one project. Why? Because so you can be laser beam focused. Uh, now your investigation continues. Investigation never stops because I found deals the day before the closing, the day before the lawyers and accountants and everybody signed, I decided not to do it because we continue to investigate. Tim Harris, uh, my top lawyer, tells me, you know, I just found out uh, the guy did this, that, and the other thing. Or we just found out, we just got a leak from the government that the, the law is going to change, whatever. Okay, so you always continue to investigate. Um, then you put an action plan, uh, you and other decision makers. The action plan will be get the rest of the people in the company or in the division or in the group obsessed. Uh, and you walk your talk and you never share a doubt. I already told you about me sharing a doubt. Uh, and I don't share doubts, you know. And the, before they pull the plug on my breathing machine, I'm going to say, I'm going to live to be 315, and I'm going to bury uh, Robert and Sally, like I always tease them about, because <laughs> I got a better heart than they do. Uh, and, uh, and then they pull the plug, okay? But I'm never going to tell anybody, well, I'm not sure. No, you never share a doubt. Uh, and that's one of the biggest and most critical things I see in the amateurs. None of the high performance people share doubts. None! And all the amateurs do. Okay. Um, critical path, other decision makers. Now you're, you're, if you have other people, if, I, if it's only you, then it's you. You put the critical path together, a timeline. Okay, this has got to be done by Monday, this has got to be done by next Thursday, this has got to be done in two, etc. Critical path. Uh, hopefully, you know, you're not having to do it. But you got to do all this. When you get to used to it, it's not so difficult. When you do it the first couple of times, you know, this is a lot of shit to do. Okay, you put the critical path together. Okay. Um, 
Then uh, do you, let's see, blah, 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 blah. okay, uh, detailed observation of uh, the timeline, I already said that, uh, and then you continue to measure. You perform and measure, perform and measure, recalculate, perform and measure. Uh, you don't fail, no rocket ship goes straight to the moon, it fails its way to the moon because you continue to readjust. Um, implementation, this, the other decision makers again, if it's not just you, focus follow up on, on other levels. So they're continuing to follow up on the other two or three levels. If you have that, if not, you're just continuing to follow up on your own self to make sure that you get this shit done. Focus follow up um, the, uh, of the, the decision makers that report to you. And then execution, laser beam focus, uh, lead from the front, never second guess yourself or second guess your senior people. Um, better get the deal done even with some mistakes than not to get it done and then you always have time to reevaluate. A reevaluation of the monitoring system continues throughout the process. Now, the deal's done. And you go back and you look at what you said you were going to do against what you did. Okay, let's say you got 88% of the shit, like you said. That's high. It's probably not going to be that high. It'll be 60 or 70%, but you're still able to get it done. Why is it 88% or why isn't it 100%? Because shit happens. Yeah. But then you go back and you look at why it didn't happen at 100%. What can we learn from it? And you sit, you sit in the room, you know, a week or a weekend pass, you know, everybody relaxes, has a couple of drinks, and he says, okay, what did we learn from this? How could we have done it better? What's the difference between 88 and 100? This, this, and this. We allowed the uh, lawyers to bullshit us and get off the hook and not perform as they said they would, the accountants, whatever the reason. In some cases, Regulatory actions happen. The law changes. Now, normally you have a heads up about law changes, but it doesn't always. You know, there may be something in Congress, depending on the business you're in, that will be changed retroactive to January 1, 2008. And here you're closing tomorrow. So you go in and you cut a deal, you know, you indemnify them a little there, indemnify you a little, and you still get it done. My advice, uh, sage as it is, is that uh, a deal done that is close to being what you thought it was is better than no deal at all. Then there's the Mikey system. The slam bam, thank you, ma'am. You know, thanks for the fuck, sweetheart. Get out of my life. You think about what the outcome you want. Okay, you think about the desired completion. How much are you willing to uh, commit? In other words, what's your pay price to action? How much? sweat, blood, and tears, and skin am I willing to give to this deal? You measure the deal periodically. Uh, I like to measure them daily. Uh, some people measure them weekly. Uh, I would never go beyond weekly. And you understand that you're going to modify the plan as you go through. You change the plan as necessary. And you measure the modified plan. And you cut it down. This is easier if there's only one person. It's one person. If there's not enough to do if there's more than one person. As I said, uh, if you send a rocket toward the moon, 95, about 95% of the time it's off course, it fails its way to the moon by continually making mistakes and correcting them. I see more deals die because they get a plan and they put the plan, they tell the board or whoever they're going to get, and they put it in their desk, and then they never look at it again, and they expect in three months it to be completed, and then they're surprised why it isn't completed because there was no continual mono monitoring of it. I know some of the stuff that Robert and I are involved in, I mean, they're daily monitored. Hourly monitored. And I wish that we could monitor it more than hourly. Because, you know, like I said, some people are so worthless, you know, and some people are so good, the few, and there's some people so worthless. You can monitor by the second. And and it's normally when the people are so worthless is because when you're asking them to quantum leap out of the comfort zone. It's something that they just can't live with. You know, they can't. They just can't. Another simple way of looking at this is that what I call the pay price to action. We, we have a problem that needs to be solved. In 21st century jargon, we have a challenge. And I want to tell you the difference between a challenge and a problem. A challenge is the difference between having your fifth and sixth orgasm. 
That's a challenge. The problem is not having any fucking orgasm. So just remember that. Okay. We want more revenue. We have higher. We want higher net worth. We want a three-hour marathon. We want to lose 20 pounds. We want just the children. Yes to all three. We all have problems, but we don't want to solve all our problems. It depends on the cost to solve or pay price to action. We want to be wealthy problem, but we don't want to work hard, pay price to action. We know what it takes to lose weight, more exercise, less calories, but we don't do it. We want to run a three-hour marathon, and we know we've got to run uh, 40 to 70 miles a week. Forget about it. We know intuitively in our heart and in our brain what it takes to do some of these things. We need to grow our business. How do we grow our business? Well, we need another sawmill or another whatever the hell it is, or a bigger sawmill. How do we get a bigger sawmill? Well, we got to get more money somewhere. Do we have money? We have part of the money to put up, but we got to go to financial institutions and convince them with the collateral of the new sawmill, and if we keep the old sawmill, it's enough money, yada, yada, yada. We know all that. But if we never talk to any financial institutions, we're never going to buy any other sawmill unless we fund it all out of our money. And if none of us want to go to the financial institution, we're pissing in the wind, so why are we talking about it? And we're faced with problems, challenges, situations like that every single day. And to the most, for the most part, much of management that reports to us isn't candid with us. Won't tell us, well, that's a stupid idea, Dave. Who the fuck came up with that idea? Do you realize how difficult it is, whatever the idea is? I want you to quadruple the uh, amount of shit that you put out every day. What is he, what's he smoking? I mean, is he down here breaking my fingernails? And, uh, no, he's not. He doesn't even come to the office for a fucking uh, week. You know, jerking around with his girlfriend. That's why the people on the floor normally will have a better idea. But the people on the floor have to be pushed. Because if you ask them if it can be done, they'll say no. So you got to push them. So the, the key is how far can you push them? How far do they get them to the Peter Principle, which is the Peter Principle where they, they, they can't do it any more efficiently. Then you drop them down about 10% from their Peter Principle and they, 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 they work effectively. What they want to be dropped down is 50% below their Peter Principle. So they can you know, smoke and joke and relax and listen to the radio and all that bullshit. So your job, or the people that report to you, your manager's job, is to push them up towards the Peter Principle. Not all the way over. And I've done that a few times, and that's why I've got nervous breakdowns, and I've had you know a few people die. Peter Principle? Peter. I get it with me, but... Peter, Peter, that's what it's called. Some guy came up with it 50, 60 years ago. It's called the Peter Principle. When you push somebody beyond their range of being effective. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because Dave's never done it, or Marcus never's done it, or Mike has never done it, doesn't mean it can't be done. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, just because you've never done it doesn't mean it can't be done. That's the old story when a tree falls in the forest, does it really make a noise, or does it only make a noise when you're there listening to it? I'm here to tell you it makes a noise whether you're there or not, but... And a lot of people, and some people that have been in the company 30, 40, 50 years, would say, you know, that can't be done, you know. Or, as I said, the words that uh, eliminate from your vocabulary, that's not the way we do it here. Especially now, in the 21st century, all kinds of new data and information uh, and research about brains and how they function and what you can get them to do, an individual to do, is pretty dynamic, even, even as compared to 10 or 15 years ago. And as I said, structure follows strategy. We figure out what we're going to do as a group or as an individual, then we build the strategy around it. Not we have a strategy and then we try to make our, our, our excuse me, we have a structure and we try to make our strategy fit it. And that's the, the biggest reason companies fail when they try to acquire or merge because they're not doing it this way, structure follows strategy. AOL Time Warner is a classic example why it failed. The last thing that IBM needs right now is a vision. What it right, needs right now are tough-minded, market-driven, highly effective strategies. This is something that Robert used to have on his emails. I don't know if he does anymore. Um, there are times that when you need nothing more than you know, highly effective strategy, you don't need a vision. 
when you when you when you're when you're trying to pay your rent for the next three months and you got no money, you don't need a vision. You need a strategy that gets you the money to pay. Now, this is another hard thing for people to understand. As long as your troughs and peaks are higher than the ones before, your quantum leap program is working. As long as you're in that direction. But what happens is when you when you're here, fuck, this thing doesn't work. Or when you're here even. Or even here. This fucking thing doesn't work. You know, what is he, crazy? What's Penny smoking? And that's because we lose heart because we have a lack of self-confidence. When you have an experienced board, more importantly, an experienced mentor, he'll walk you through these. He'll walk you through these troughs. I've been through so many troughs, I can't remember now. But it's always been, I've always gone from peak to peak to peak. Andrew Carnegie once said, the prime condition of success, concentrate your energy, thought, and capital exclusively upon the business in which you are engaged. Having begun on that line, resolve to fight it out and to lead in it. Um, what happens when people start to be successful and start to accumulate cash is they diversify. Wrong. And I use the example when I was with the Onassis Group, Costa Grasso, who was the CEO of Aristotle Onassis, who was my mentor, and who was a lifetime friend for 65 years of Aristotle Onassis. He used to say, um, when every 20 or 30 years we, we get so far ahead in cash, we diversify and we lose. And he gives me the examples. We own 107 ships of Panamanian uh, flags. Pay for cash, no debt. So we decided to buy, uh, buy, build Olympic Towers on 54th and 5th, I think. Uh, when I was there, it was only 40% occupied. We don't know how to manage the building. We didn't know how to build the building. Now we got the building. Then, 20 years later, we decided, uh, we're making so much money, we're going to go in the airline business, because the airline business was hot. They started Olympic Airlines. You know, they had 60 planes or 50 planes, paid a bunch of money for each one. Didn't know how to run the business. Didn't know how to buy airlines correctly, airplanes correctly. We gave the planes back to the Greek government. Gave the airlines to him. All we know how to do is count cash. That's all we know how to do. So we just build up cash. And that's where I got the idea, you know. Build up cash. All the rest is bullshit. We don't give a fuck about inflation. We don't give a fuck about the government. We don't give a fuck about taxes. We just build up cash. And fortunately that settled with me. I took that to heart. I used to sit in Christine Onassis' office, which was my office when she was very seldom when came in the office, and I used to look down over on um, St. Patrick's Cathedral, and Robert's heard this, I used to put my feet up on the desk, sit back, and uh, in those days you could smoke in the gun, smoke in a cigar, uh, this is the life, and then the phone on the desk had uh, direct lines to the Vatican, President, C uh, uh, CEO of General Motors, and all these, and every once in a while, I never pushed those others, but I used to push the Vatican button in the White House. I used to push the Vatican button. And they say, uh, I, I forget how they answer the phone now. And I hang up the phone. You know, <laughs> and then I do it again. You know. uh, and uh, the, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was a great relationship. Again, as I said earlier, I wish I had told him how, about, how, how much he meant to me, but. That's why my suggestion is the people that do mean something to you, tell them before they're dead. That's the guy who lost a bunch of wives at sea? Yeah. He lost, uh, legend is that he's lost six wives at sea. Terrible sea accidents. They all drowned. Wow. You know, what are you going to do? Shit happens. His seventh wife, who was Austrian, come to think of it, would never go on a plane, uh, boat with him. She wouldn't fly with him, like with trains. They never left the United States. And uh, some of the advice he, he gave me, um, and he used to shuffle like this when he got old in his eighties, like this, and he used to hold my arm and be going. He says, Mr. P Mr. Pena, he always called me Mr. Pena. He never called me Dan. I called him Mr. Grazos, then Constantine, then Costa, towards the end of his life. And he said, uh, Mr. Pena, would you like to have lunch? And we'd always go to the Le Grand Cuisine, which is across the street French restaurant. There was always a table open. 
And he said, well, I'm gonna go to the men's room. So we shuffle over there and we're taking a pee and he's talking to me, he says, two of the great bits of advice that he ever gave me and he says, use it before you lose it. We're both taking a pee. Use it before you lose it. I said, yes, sir. I know the time we're in the toilet. And he says to me, he says, come here. He says, Mr. Penny, and he looks at the urine, oh, not the urinal, but the commode. You see that commode? He says, what do you see there? I see porcelain, water. He says, look at the water level. I said, yes. And he says, what would happen if you stuck your fist in the water level? And I said, well, it would displace water and the water would rise. And what would happen if you pulled your fist out of the water? Well, the water would go back down and it'd be just like my fist was never there. That's life. You die and nobody's going to know anything that you even lived. So just remember that. You're nothing, in, you know, when you think something's so important and you've got such a big decision, etc., etc., you know, and I, and I said, and I derived from that in the cosmos of time, we're nothing but a fart in the wind. And he's right. It's still, put your fist in the toilet, it's like you weren't there. The only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. Uh, we talked about that already. <clears throat> In growth, I mean, you've got a plan for success, no backup plans, and I, and I don't like backup plans, a plan B, C, and D, because then subconsciously, we're talking about growth still, subconsciously, you know you can fall back on plan B. But then if there is no plan B, then you make plan A work. Uh, the more you investigate, the less you have to invest. Another great line I got. Uh, and uh, because I investigate so much, I mean, you know, I don't invest that much because there's always something, uh, there's no perfect investment, but if you do enough homework, you always find something, you know, un wrong with it. And so at the end of the day, you have to go with your gut feel. Getting people selling your dream and letting go of part of it, don't get trapped by pride of authorship. I've seen pride of authorship kill more deals than Jews were killed by Hitler during the war. My business is worth too much money. I can't let loose of, you know, 10% or 20% or 30%. You know, what if they throw me out? I've seen pride of authorship kill more deals than, than, than anything. If you're experiencing no anxiety and discomfort, the risk you're taking probably isn't worthy of you. The only, rock, the only risks that aren't a little scary are the ones you've outgrown. A high comfort level provides solid evidence that you're playing it safe, not drawing, not really testing your limits at all, and not in the process of a quantum leap. Uh, Doris yesterday didn't feel as well as she may have done the first day because she was using herself and measuring herself against some of the benchmarks we went through both this time around and two years around. And I said that most of you have never been sick to your stomach about something. Maybe in a love affair your wife left you or you found your wife having an affair and it made you ill and blah, blah. But I mean, if you're not having those feelings in business, it's because you're not stretching yourself. You're not stretching yourself. Progress often masquerades as trouble. When I ask you, and I've already said this, how are things doing, Doris? She says, wonderful. I know the business is dying. I'd rather hear, oh, the bank's trying to foreclose, the this, the that, uh, acquisition fell out of bed, swine, I want to fucking kill them, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I want to hear. <laughs> uh, never time to count your victories. Any problem solved will be immediately replaced by a larger, more complicated one. This is a tough thing to get across to my kids. They get through a problem, an emotional problem. You know, what do you think of that, Dad? I solved it. I said, yeah, okay, that's great, son. But it, another worse one's coming. <clears throat> Gee, Dad, why don't you let me live in the light of some... Uh, yeah. Because I'm just being honest with you. You know, the shit's going to hit the fan. If you're doing it right. Yeah. We're going to have one more role play. Okay, who's up? We can have a Peters, so... Who's up? I'll do it. You haven't done it, Marcos. Yeah, I don't know. It's mean, it's mean, it's just good enough. I'll talk Albanian. Do you understand? Yeah, then it's going to come, but it's a cash. How do you? Don't put it in his bathroom break. Yeah, okay, quick round. Okay. Come on. Come on. You do it. You do it. You do it in German, I'll do it in Albanian, right? That's she said no, and put it in here. Okay, they've got to translate it. <laughs> and we'll have a Russian mediator. <laughs> Just do it. Nike. Oh. Nike. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Who's it going to be for the next? Um, okay. Albanians versus Russians. Okay, I was going to say we should have you speak Albanian, you speak German, and then you translate into Russian. <laughs> okay, this is the deal. Let's well, let's use your real business. Uh, let's use uh, the um, let's make it a, a shorter goal. Let's make it um, uh, five million in revenue, and um, um, and you need um, well, how much money would you need to increase? Five million. Yeah. I think we need around about two million. Two million. Okay. I was just asking him. He, his brother, work a hundred hours a week, right? Does your dad work that? Yeah. My dad works eighty hours in the sawmill and twenty hours in the farm. Uh, at, at the farm, sorry. You have a farm. Yeah. My father has a farm. Yeah. Okay. How old is your dad? Fifty-one, fifty-two. And he works from sixteen years until he's sixteen. He works each day. Each day. Each day. Each day. Yeah. And um, it's good. That's why, that's where Kauswitz comes from. See? <laughs> good, good, good Austrian, uh, you know, that's why they had good soldiers. Okay, so you need two million from the, uh, the bank to, uh, uh, to increase your revenues to five million. Um, and, um, okay, so you're going to go into Mikey, he's the banker. He's your friendly Austrian banker. He's my banker. Huh? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, help me. Okay. And uh, what what big city do you live in? Big city. Okay, that's there are three thousand. It's called Obdak, and there are three thousand seven hundred people. Three thousand seven hundred. Yes, a very, a very big one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big city. Uh, how close to Vienna are you? Two hundred and ten kilometers. <clears throat> okay. Three thousand seven hundred. Okay, you sent them the package. Yeah. Um, I'm your chairman. Um, I have had experience in the wood business, not in sawmills, but in, in, in general wood. Uh, and uh, you have a um, Price Waterhouse Coopers or your accountants. Um, I don't just pick any German law firm name. I, I don't know any. Oh, no, no. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the German firm. I can't think of it now. Anyway, and um, you want um, two million dollars for five years, and you um, can uh, increase your business well, roughly, I guess, four times. Four times. Four okay. Times. Four times. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Hi. Good day. Nice to see you again. Thanks for coming to the big city, all 3,700 of us. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so it's going on about this thing. We want to grow up to 5 million total revenue. For this plan, I need 2 million. Mm -hmm. um, you know my, my numbers. We grow up uh, three times last year. Our margin is by 20%. The, the numbers are really good. And now I... Are they better than your competitors? Pardon? Are they better, better than your competitors? Better. How much better? better? Uh, we are around about 10% better than our, our competitors. So right now, you're 10% better. Yeah. Next year, how much percent better will you be with the money? With the money, it's, it's uh, bigger, we can earn more, and we will use it to... Be is it short-term growth or does it take a while, long-term growth? No, no, no. It's a short-term growth. Yeah. It's... I think we will need uh, two and three hours, uh, three years, two years, maybe, to, to grow up to to, uh, total revenue for five million. So within three years, um, that's, so let me get this straight, so within the third year, that's when you need to actually start growing? No, no, we start growing now, okay? Now. 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 Like now, now's good. <laughs> and uh, it, if uh, it will take two years to get in the whole year, the total revenue of about 5 million euro, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? By margin, by 20%, so we are around about by 1 million before tax. So you can see it's a, I think, not so bad thing. It's not really good, but I'm not so bad. So um, I think we should do it, and let's go. Okay, well, tell me a little bit about your competition, though. Um, are these companies that you can 
put out of business or anything you can acquire? Oh, it's, it's, bigger? it's, 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 it's um, are your competitions getting money also? Um, to beat no, you no. For the are they asking for 10 million from somewhere yeah. to beat your ass? Do you know that they were no, this they morning? Can't. No, they, oh, they can't. can't do it. They can't beat me. How come? Because I'm. What's it? Is it right positioning? I don't need. Okay, I'm, I make a really different. Um, you have a unique selling proposition. Yes, right. Oh, that's okay. the other thing that all other makes. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm positioning by a, a really smart market, but I want to go grow. Uh, want to go bigger, and uh, that's the thing you can do. Does that right? include marketing and distribution? Yes, yes, yes. In yes. this, all of, yes, all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Alpha board. The chairman is Mr. Ben Benner. I, I know. Okay. <laughs> You can call him if you want. Nah, I'm not looking to call him. Yeah, you can have the number, you can call him. <laughs> you don't need to call him. Thank you, though. Okay, and you, you know, uh, you know every other things, the lawyers. You know, I was just, you know, going you through our finances. You, you, you need but, five million, right? Five million. Do you have anything that you can um, back that by? So, okay. Now we always have to, have to make a, a thing that we are made something for you. I don't know. We, I think you have machines, right? Yes. How much money machines do you have? Oh, uh, now it's around about four hundred thousand. You own them outright. Yeah. Okay, but that's not the thing. You got nothing for me. You know my because you know my numbers. Mm -hmm. You know how it works. You know where, uh, where we're coming from. Yeah. And and now we have the chairman, um, Mr. Dan Banner. And if there's something going wrong, then then everything Would you will be willing go wrong. Would you be willing to put up huh? your equipment as collateral? But once again. Would you be willing to put up all your four hundred thousand dollars of equipment that you own that's yours? Yes. Up as collateral. That if this deal goes bad by me doing the cash flow drawdown on your company and it's not doing as well as you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. By this yeah. time I take your machines and you're out of fucking business. No, that we don't want to do. Cause. Mm. Let's make a deal, okay? You, we make ten percent. It's maybe from four hundred thousand. It's uh, four hundred forty thousand, and that's the deal. You got it. You can do it or not. Um, you you got it. You can you can have forty thousand to be sure that the business is going going right. How and fast do you blow through forty thousand? Pardon? How fast can you blow through forty thousand? Spend. Spend. Spend forty thousand tomorrow. One day. Every day, you your mean, operation costs of forty thousand a day. Once again, I cannot understand. Is it forty? Okay, I have forty thousand dollars of your assets now. Yeah. Right? This is your forty thousand, and yeah. I'm sipping it. Yeah. How long does it take you to sip your forty thousand? Forty thousand, maybe one month. One month? You know what? I can deal with one month. Would you be willing to give me um? The operations weekly for about two three weeks, and then we can take it from there. The operation what the operation report. The operation yeah, reports. Oh, you can have it uh, monthly. We can have it monthly. No, I'd like to start off weekly, and I'll be able to. Like, okay, to let's make the deal. It's it's too long for me. Yeah, we we, we make we make you got uh, the numbers monthly. At first yeah. of all, the first month, no, the first three months. The I'm first three the first three months. The, the first three months, you get it. Okay. And the numbers are right. You give me the money, the money of all, and then you make the business. If not, I go out and go to other bank. Okay? What other bank? Other bank. Hey, come, come on. We have made every business now. And now that's the thing. Okay? You, you can do it or not. Are you gonna scrap them? God, yo, can you you make now that only you are the one bank in this town? But I can go to the next one. Or to then the who's gonna one. work to make the bring in the money? What? How many hours a week do you work? How many hours? Yeah. Myself? Yourself. 100. You're going to lose 100 hours a week for two weeks if you leave town. Where are you going to go? You can. Yes, I can. So, uh, so we, if you don't want to do it, we have to... I didn't it. say I didn't want to do it. I'm just saying you have to play ball on my terms. Every week. I want to fucking know what you, your dad, and your brother's doing, and how good you're doing it, based on five. You got it. You got it, monthly, my friend. And if it's not enough, okay, you got it, monthly. Okay, you got it, monthly. 
two months. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, man, Flip. Twice, okay? But this is all contingent upon the first few months, the whole deal. You know that. This isn't a, a done deal, as they say. I'm willing to give you the money, but I want... You said it happens like this, right? Yes. Not one year... No, 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 no. I, not, I don't can, uh, not, can, can change the revenue like this to five million one year. I need two years. You need three, you need three years. Three, two, but, two until three years. Mm -hmm. But the I need happens this quickly. Yes, of course. And you, and you said very quickly. So you said instantaneously quickly. Yes, yes, so yes. I expect to see the results quickly. Yes. So where the fuck are you going? You're going out of town for 100 hours a week? What happens if your brother gets sick? That's 200 hours. What happens, God forbid, your whole family gets sick. 300 hours, you're going down. Why should I be in this deal? Once again, I don't. 300 hours and I should not going down. God for, okay. Who he else says if, three, if, if all three of you get sick, there'll be nobody to run the sawmill. Okay. Next was the thing. Why should go to sick? Because man playing. And, God laughs. And, and, and the next thing is, there are not only, only three guys. There are six, seven, seven eight. Eight guys. You have eight employees? Yes. Okay. My friend. Hey, you should know it. Come so, on. So you, have, you, you have to make... Oh, you make me sick. <laughs> seriously. Yeah, but who... Know how freaking that's freaking exactly how they, they, they sit, talk to the Germans when you, if, if you're not prepared, as they are, that's exactly how they talk to you. <laughs> that's just, you have to know, you, you <laughs> might believe <laughs> it, You know, I should be... We make guys. business since two years, and you don't know how, how much it was, I have. Hey, I Normally I say that and get out the... <laughs> Okay, 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 and that's exactly how they are in that part of the world. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, they expect, oh, they, they expect you to be prepared. If you're the banker for two years, yeah. you expect you to know the numbers. Yeah, and so... Because we have a really small town, you have to know it. I just care about performance, you have to know it. Yeah. I just care about performance, that's it. Uh -huh. yeah. Keep them accountable. <laughs> Okay, well that, that was uh, a little entertaining. <laughs> okay. This is this can't be fun. Yeah. <laughs>